Hello and welcome to Eddie Hurst's podcast version of The War of the Worlds, the podcast where we take H.G. Wells' seminal classic, The War of the Worlds, chapter by chapter, smashing it up into smithereens, mixing it together again with comedy songs, guests, deep dives of research, greater production values than you would expect, plowing it all into a podcast mould, putting it in the fridge for upwards of 24 hours, and serving it to you via the internet. We're on Interlude 4, which is a break from the chapters of the book to add in a few things that I didn't get a chance to put into the previous chapters. We've got a song about black smoke that uh, didn't make it in because we had some fantastic guest work on, and also a deep dive, a very deep dive, I'll add. Uh, it was a bit too long to put into another chapter on H.G. Wells' worst ever predictions. Everybody talks about the great predictions that uh, sci-fi writers do, but they rarely talk about the misfires, so we're having a look at that as well. If this is the first episode you're joining us on, welcome, thank you. This is a great place to start because it's not actually part of the book proper, but it gives you an idea of the sort of songs that are in it, the sensibility that I bring to the War of the Worlds. And if this is the first episode you're listening to, well, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Please make sure that you've subscribed, rate and review the podcast. That doesn't just go for you listening the first time. This is for any of you. Heck, you can go and review it twice. Why not? It gets it more visible to other people. So if you're listening on uh, Apple, on Stitcher, on basically anywhere except for Spotify, you can rate and review it. So please do. It helps other people find it. Remember the feeling of discovery and joy that you had when you first listened? Imagine somebody else having that. And if you didn't feel discovery and joy, well, imagine somebody else feeling that and and, and maybe give them that treat. Because it's it's Christmas now. It's a time for giving. So we're going to go into the interlude now. Um, if you want to follow me, you can. I'm at Eddie Hurst on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, basically wherever you want. That's all the news for the podcast is going to go on there as well. So let's go into it. Uh, we're going to start with HG Wells' worst ever predictions and then have the little song about Black Smoke, then I'll come back. So, hey, that black smoke that we've been seeing in the last couple of chapters sounds pretty awful. I I mean, I'm not a fan of smoke in general. Sure, there's worse stuff than smoke, but it's definitely not in my top five airborne things, which are, of course, bats, bugs, birds, a cooling mist in a humid climate, and Fred Flintstone when he slides off the back of a brontosaurus tail into his car. Yeah, ba da ba do But you know what? I think we've got another one of H.G. Wells' world-famous predictions of the future here. You know, look, we've had lasers, we've had rockets, and now we've got what looks like a foresight of chemical warfare. Jesus, keep it light, Herbert. As we discussed in Chapter 6, Herbie G was a bugger for having a guess at the future. So much so that he actually requested when he passed away that written on his gravestone was I told you so, you damned fools. Which is up there as a gravestone phrase with Spike Milligan's I told you I was ill. And also anybody that takes a little bit more care towards their family and loved one's feelings by having something that isn't just a glib showboating remark. Just kidding, I'm totally having If the graves are rocking, don't come a-knocking on my tomb as it gets shot out into the stratosphere. That's one small step for man, one giant fro for this weird dead guy. Whilst H.G. Wells became known as a steam-powered Nostradamus, that's not to say that everything he suggested was right. Quite often, what Wells' real talent for is getting the rough area of something, you know, the spirit of a guess. Uh, which is kind of a bit like pointing at the right continent when you're trying to guess a town's location on an atlas. I mean, it's not the exact area, but it's vaguely impressive. Whilst some of you may say that rather than guessing what's happening, the future will soon come to you and lie down at your feet like a dog. Who doesn't love a good little sneaky peek, right? To celebrate, we're going to take a look at some of the slight misfires from the machine gun of tomorrow's truths. That's uh, that's H.G. Wells, a big old, big old machine gun of tomorrow's truths, and... No, I will not make that metaphor any less clunky. Dial up news! Wells was a big believer that newspapers were about to hit the pits, which feels like one of those things that people say every time there's a new communication technology, right? Telegrams! Newspapers are toast, baby! The telephone! Sayonara! The written word! The television! Bye-bye, static word rags! The internet! Ho-ho, you better believe the print is about to go in the stink! And this idea that newspapers are about to all stop and fold is just clung on forever. Like a little man on a bucket. A tiny little bucket man. I'm Terry, and I'm good at clinging on to buckets! You go get him, Terry. Anyway... Well's prediction was that a sort of telephone device would tell you the news on demand. Uh, This was mentioned in his 1899 book, The Sleeper Wakes. What I like most about the prediction is that it makes this sort of noise that's like, galoop, galoop, before and after everything it says. So if you were to be like, hey, can you tell me the news? It'd be, galoop, galoop. Uh, people have died today. Galoop, galoop. Which is, uh, 
uh, not ideal to break that news. Why the prediction might be right. It's like an Alexa, isn't it? Or a, or a Google Home or one of the virtual assistants or, or a podcast or a radio news show or, or even just having, having the news immediately accessible on your, on your phone, isn't it? It's like that. Why it's not quite right. I mean, the, the, they talk about the machine as if it's the only thing it does is give you the news. Alexa does loads more than that. It tries to sell you lots of things and refuses to play the song you ask it to. Like, why the hell would anyone choose to have a funnel of fresh hell coming straight into their bedroom every morning? In the book, it talks about the protagonist finding out about the fall of France as a great value of the machine. Do you really need to hear about that as soon as you open your eyes? Anyway, I'm going to go doom scrolling on Twitter before I go to sleep, because I really need some more realistic night terrors tonight. Dictatorships of love. Coming out in 1933, Wells' book, The Shape of Things to Come, was one of his biggest for future visions. I mean, like the the hint in the title of the book, in it, like things to things to come. It's going to be about stuff that's about to happen. It was also turned into the snappier titled film Things to Come in 1936. But just as my title for this bit suggests, this ain't about things he got right, like aerial bombing, the atomic bomb, and a big old war in the 1940s. But instead, it's about his ideas of how the world led into a utopia after all of that which according to him was through a benevolent dictatorship. In the book he talks about a dictatorship of the skies, but essentially what he's talking about is a bunch of level-headed lads, and they are definitely men, with scientific knowledge, most likely, I don't know, part of the lower middle class, maybe they've got crazy names like, I don't know, Herbert George Wells, or maybe they've got slightly different names to his, eschewing religion and social norms in place of rational thought for the good of the world. Just by like crazy coincidence, the sort of ideas and things that Herbert himself would have had. Crazy. What a weird coincidence. Why the prediction might be right. Well, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I'd suggest dictatorships have a bit of a bad reputation now, what with solely being based upon the whims and thoughts of a single person. But I guess around the world there must be some places where dictatorships have been alright. Maybe? Uh I had a I had a search and apparently a guy called Josip Broz Tito of Yugoslavia, a former country in the southeast of Europe, was referred to as a benevolent dictator. You know, he ruled with complete control, but he was doing it with the best interests of his citizens in mind. However, I would say that whilst I was looking up some of the work that he did provide in state support to the people of Yugoslavia, I also found that he was wanted for the following war crimes. Uh, the Breiberg reparations, the Foiber massacres, the Tesno massacres, the Marcelge massacres, the Barber Pit massacres, and to top it off, a communist purge. So that's a lot, I mean, that's a lot of massacres, and that's meant to be one of the only dictators who was seen as good. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I think any massacre is probably, probably a bad move on a government's part. Why it's not quite right! I mean, do you want me to go through that list again? I mean, I'm, I'm sure many rulers would rather it wasn't the case, but for most of the world-leading countries, we have a vague semblance of democracy where, in whatever janky system, there is at least the odd chance that your vote might mean something. Historically, dictatorships haven't worked that much, because I get that the idea of a dictator is tempting if that dictator is this fantastical being that loves everyone and provides answers for every problem. But life isn't really that clear-cut, and often it's based on compromise, for the chaos of the world we exist in is often strange and unusual, and sometimes things done for the right reason lead to bad things, or a new unexpected consequence. That's also not to mention that- I mean, what I'm saying is it's not happened, has it? We haven't been swallowed up into nuclear fallout, and a science of dictatorship hasn't rocked up and sorted everything out. Yet? Human-animal hybrids. Uh-oh, what's that in the news? They've spliced the DNA of a pig with a human in China, and now it has a bloodlust for pork and human flesh? The forbidden love between a chimpanzee and a human has finally been realised by combining the cells of both great species, and now it's created a human Z or a chimpan man? Since as far back as ancient Egyptian times, and, and probably before that, we've been imagining our gods as humans with animal parts, or animals that can take the forms of humans. And as we came to realise in the Victorian era that our evolutionary paths cross more of the beasts of Earth than previously thought, science started sniffing around this idea of combining humans and animals in an actual reality. Could we be closer to the animals than we thought? Could we squawk with the animals? talk with the animals, swap our body parts with the animals to produce new creatures from the hands of man. With the animals. This is something Wells talks about in his most horrifying book, The Island of Dr. Moreau, where a creepy scientist does creepy experiments that are, uh, cre creepy. Bas basically, it's like Dr. Frankenstein goes to the zoo. You get like a leopard man, you get a pig man, any, any, any animal and then man followed by it is what he can do. Why the prediction might be right. Did you not read that news story about those experimental animal human chimeras? It's happening! We're playing God if God exclusively worked in farmyard fusion. 
To be fair, it is probably once or twice a year that we hear news of experiments that look to grow organs for human transplant on animal hosts. In fact, just in October this year, there was a news story that an adapted pig's heart could be used to transplant into a human body to save their lives. Which is great news considering the difficulties that come with human-to-human -human transplants, but it is a bit murky ethically, isn't it? You know, grabs the attention, grabs the imagination, you know, that mankind could wield this power over nature. It's a, it's a real, it's a, it's a real theme. It's a real theme. Now, it's like in Jurassic Park and stuff as well, isn't it? It's a recurring sci-fi trope that you see a lot. Why it's not quite right! Nearly every news article that you see about this stuff even now is about how far off we are from actually getting to this point. Like, there was a big bit of Chinese research that came out last year that was meant to have rocked the world, and as you're probably able to tell from the fact that neither of us are now part human, part pig things, or there aren't there aren't pigmen living in the world, uh, that, that didn't quite rock the world so much as it did maybe mildly shake it. I mean, what's less than a shaker? A, a, a shiver, perhaps? I mean, when I had a look into it, um, I, I, I'm no expert of genetic science. I have very little understanding of it, so it's quite tricky to get my head around. But it seemed that apparently the results were there was only one human cell found in the 100,000 pig cells in the experiment, uh, like, which I, do, I don't think is a, is a lot. I'm going to say that isn't a lot. And genetic chimeras aside, this isn't what Wells was predicting. He was predicting that somebody would cut and stick animal bits onto a human or human bits onto an animal, which defo hasn't worked. I mean, when was the last time you saw someone walking around with a crab claw or a monkey tail? <laughs> right? It's not happened. <sighs> what a ding. It's me, it's H.G. Wells. I've broken through this broadcast with my time machine. Listen, not every book I did was a prediction of the future. This book was actually more of just a take on the horror trope of experiments gone wrong than an actual claim of what might happen. I, I wouldn't have suggested this would happen. Anyway, uh, back out! Bye! Sorry, not quite sure what happened there. It looks like somebody messed about with the files that I'm editing. Any anyway, I'll just leave that in. What a anyway, what an idiot HG Wells was. You can't put pigeon wings on a person. <laughs> anyway, it'd look, it'd look weird. It'd look really, really weird, wouldn't it? It'd be stupid to, to do that. One day, my sweet sky rat, you will fly. One day! A devastating plague in 1956 and 1957. Again in the shape of things to come, Wells follows up a nuclear holocaust with a plague across Europe, wiping out swathes of the population between 1956 and 57. Because I think at this point Wells was going through a lot in terms of his relationship to humanity. Feels like he was working through a lot of things. Perhaps it was the rise of fascism and the Great Depression that the world was facing during the 1930s. Or maybe it was all the insensible idiots who kept bumping into him whenever he turned around corners. Why it's not quite right! Come on! A plague didn't hit humanity until late 2019 and early 2020! <laughs> right guys? <laughs> But on a serious note about this, one thing that is reassuring about how he got his prediction wrong is that when a plague or a pandemic actually did hit humanity, uh, instead of society falling apart and people turning on each other and we having mass hysteria running up Chobham Road with a revolver in hand, we have banded together and taken huge sacrifices for everyone's well-being and safety. But still, <laughs> he had the audacity to guess something for our amusement and be proven wrong. <laughs> Egg on his face, right? Egg on his face. Hello? Hello? 
And there you have Interlude 4. Now, when you're at a dinner party or something and somebody goes, Hey, did you know H.G. Wells often predicted the future spot on? Uh, because I imagine you go to dinner parties that are like that. I mean, I've never been to a dinner party, so I wouldn't I wouldn't know. Uh, but when they say that, you can go like, <laughs> uh, I think you'll find that I have actually four examples of where he was slightly wrong, if not in spirit, then in reality. So, uh... You will be the talk of the town, I'm sure. And also that little song about black smoke, which was absolutely just a way to showcase some of my jokes. Which was absolutely also just a way to do some stupid jokes, because I quite like jokes. I don't know if you know that, because I'm a comedian. Uh, if, if you don't know that, I do need to address that. That seems like an issue. If this is your first episode, thank you so much. Please do go back and listen from chapter one. There is a whole book practically for you. There's only two chapters left of book one, and then we're going to get started on book two, which will be sometime in the new year. Until then, you can follow me at Eddie Hurst on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you want to send me an email, you know, if you've been listening along, maybe you've got questions about some of the deep dives, even corrections. Heck, I'll take them. I mean, I'm not an expert in this field. I'm just somebody with way too much time on their hands in 2020, which I think is very relatable to many people listening. If you want to get in touch with me there, you can send me an email, eddiehurst at gmail.com. I'd love to hear what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you've got anything you'd like to add in, let me know. Thank you very much, guys, and I'll see you in a little bit for the next chapter, chapter 16.